Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another episode of the Muslim Vibe podcast. I'm your host Asib Rizvi and today we're going to be talking about the life and legacy of Malcolm X, the impact he's had and the lessons that we can learn. And I'm honoured to have with me today Hashim Ali Alauddin who is a scholar, writer and dedicated community activist. He's also a very close friend of the of Malcolm X's family, uh, particularly his daughter Kabila Shabazz and he was the mentor and spiritual advisor for Malcolm X's grandson uh, Malcolm Latif Shabazz. So let's jump straight into the conversation with Hashim. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum brother Hashim. Wa alaikum salam brother Hasi. How are you doing today? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's my honor to have you on this podcast today. It's an honor to be here too. So Hashim, we're here to discuss um, perhaps one of the most important Muslims in, in modern history, uh, if not entire history. Uh, and of course, uh, we're talking about Malcolm X, um, who's been like a huge role model for me growing up. Um, you know, his pictures here in my office, um, just this year, completed the autobiography. And, you know, just, just someone that I think is perhaps one of the most beautiful human beings to, to walk this planet, someone that was so in touch with his core purpose um, and someone that, you know, you can just say that Allah literally picked up from one place like the gutter and, and elevated him to the highest of ranks and, and granted him uh, martyrdom and he died shaheed. How has Malcolm X um, affected your life? Like what, what impact has he had on your life personally? Uh, I would say that um, Malcolm's effect on me has is multiple, right? I think that I was talking to somebody earlier today about Malcolm's life, and it's funny you said you finished the autobiography, right? I think that one of the problems we have is many people read the autobiography, they don't study the autobiography, or they look mm. at the autobiography and they don't internalize the autobiography. Uh, I came in view of Malcolm early on in life in high school, but I had already been on a quest as a person who read philosophy and religious and stuff, religion like that, before I got in contact with Malcolm. But um, but my senior year, I mean, crazy as I knew who Malcolm was, but I got more into Malcolm because there was a, a connection between hip hop and Malcolm. You know, uh, Chuck D, I was telling somebody today, you know, you had Chuck D with Malcolm X's picture up there, and then you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? And I knew of Malcolm, I started reading him, I knew of him, but I started looking deeper into him as he became connected to social justice issues, right? Um, and also just from a religious point. But to me, the biggest thing and impact of Malcolm's life to me that's always not, not looked upon is the one you said, him coming from this gutter to something hot. Mm. I was saying the other day, Allah in the Quran says, Allah is the wali of the Aminur. Allah is the wali of those who believe. He leads them from Zulamat ila Nur, from levels of darkness to Noor. And then Tagut is evil is the is the Wali, the leader of unbelief. It takes people from Zulamat, I mean Noor to Zulamat. I think Malcolm's life is that eye of Quran in many ways because when you look at Zulamat, Zulamat in Arabic is plural, meaning there's levels of darkness. But there's mm. only one Noor, one Noor, one light. And so when we look at Malcolm early on in life, he goes, he gets to be in high school, and he's in light like any kid, and then he goes down that path. And then he's pulled out of that path. The reason I mention it is that many people look at Al-Haj Malik Shabazz's life from the point of direction of the social political things, they miss the spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And so why do I say that? Because when I was on my own spiritual quest, I believe in the law. I just wanted to be a Christian. I want to find out what's the correct way of following the law. Two books were the most significant in that finding that journey for me. Um, one was Siddhartha by Herman Hess, and the other one was Elijah Malcolm X. Most people get the Malcolm X part. They're like, well, what has Siddhartha and Buddha got to do with me being Muslim? Uh, because mm. I never saw Buddha saying become Buddha. I saw Siddhartha saying, you make, make a quest for truth. And so mm -hmm. to me, I didn't end up where he is by Allah's grace, but the quest of, 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 of finding something beautiful. And when I got to Autobot from Malcolm X, I was definitely into the social, political, the blackness of it, but the journey and the experience, hey, this is not this, this and the coming and coming. And think about it. Malcolm goes on this quest and he's granted the most beautiful thing in the end is Shahada. 
And what I found out in Farsi is funny. The word for Shahadat in Farsi is Shahadat Rasidan. And it's interesting because Rasidan in Persian means to uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, arrive. You know what I'm saying? Like like mm -hmm. I got, I, I received, I I was, it was received. It, you got to that point. So to me, Malcolm's spiritual journey. You know what I'm saying? Touched me a lot outside of the political journey. So I, I have so many multiple reasons why I'm in love with El Haj Malik Shabazz um, because you know of his stance and his giving his life for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that being the end of a spiritual journey that by the grace of Allah, to me, is like Imam Hussein alayhi salam and the other shahada of Islam who actually have pure shahada receiving and being for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What, what do you think it is about um, Malcolm X specifically that draws so many people towards him as, as, a, as a character? Uh, and I'm not talking about just like during his lifetime, although that's like a really important part as well. But like we see even till now, right? It's almost like, it's almost like after his death, um, his, his, you know, that's when he kind of almost reaches full potential, if that makes sense. Like as in yeah. generations later, people are truly understanding him. They're demystifying it away from all of the, the media hysteria about the things that he would say, his, his political rhetoric and stuff like that. That's all stripped away now. And at the core of it is this kind of magnificent uh, and brave and eloquent human being. Um, what is it do you, that you feel that draws so many people towards him from across different cultures? Wow, that's a good question. A beautiful question, actually. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot in the Quran says, do not say those who are killed in the way of Allah are dead, but they're living and you perceive it not, right? They martyred Malcolm and his body, but as a Shaheed, his, his, his spirit that Allah says he's living, we don't get it, it's still around. And I think that the fitra of a human being is connected to truth. Mm -hmm. Some people accept all of it, some people accept parts of it, and some people accept none of it. Malcolm is still drawn to it because of his life and his truthfulness. I think that everybody, especially African Americans, I can speak from their point, they were attracted to Malcolm for multiple, obviously, the social, political things dealing with African Americans and the spiritual stuff. But everybody takes and picks a little bit of Malcolm that they like. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. of one thing that all the things everybody picks, the one thing they have in common, I believe is sincerity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that people look at sincerity. And sincerity in his mistakes. He made mistakes and sincerely said, I was wrong. I was in a nation. I was wrong. I made this mistake. I was wrong. I don't think people really like to do that, but we respect and we honor people who do. So I think the sincerity, it's funny because Allah in the Quran, he says, What? He says, and the shaitan will say, I'll be on, I'll get to be in the front, the right, the front, the back, the right, and the left. I will tempt them. I will get them off the path. And Allah SWT tells us that he says, What the shaitan? He says, You will not have those who are mukhlis. <laughs> He didn't say you mm -hmm. won't get the scholar, the one with the most knowledge, the one. You won't get the mukhlis, the one who's sincere. I think Malcolm's sincerity is so much love by people because you fiery, barely seldom sign people who are sincere. So I say that's the foundation, one of the foundations of it, his faith, his sincerity. And I think it has different branches it goes to. So when you see him speak about social justice, people are attracted to the social justice one. Because he's sincerely talking about social justice. When he talks about race, he's sincerely talking about race. When he talks about spirituality, he's talking about just sincerely about spirituality. And I think every place he goes and he touches, you feel the energy of sincerity and change and that beauty of hasana that he gives out, I think is one of the reasons why it's, he's so attractive amongst many different races, many different cultures, and many different genders. I think, like, also, just to add to that, like, one of the things that like strikes me about um, Malcolm X is he approached Islam um, as a philosophy, like from from like a complete like clean slate, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So there's no there was no cultural baggage attached to it. It's not like his um, you know his parents were like you know practicing Muslims and they've got like their own traditions and Arab culture or like South Asian culture or anything like that. It was just like the raw kind of. Uh, approach of this right and it was driven by this passion for justice and it was driven by this passion for seeking the truth right um and i feel like that that kind of allowed him to take a very honest approach with islam and so when you know when he learned about other aspects of islam beyond the nation of islam right when he learned about like the wider reality when he went to uh hajj for example 
that's when it dawned on him. But he was in a position to receive that truth and he was in a position to receive that knowledge and hikmah and guidance from Allah because he didn't have that extra kind of baggage. So yeah. that, like, that kind of leads into my next question. Like, how, how do you think like Malcolm X's life and legacy can benefit Muslims today? Well, I, I like what you said, and I want to go back to the one thing you said about him going to Hajj. And to me, when I read the autobiography, when in my journey, when I got to the Hajj part, he described Mecca. That to me was it. Because mm -hmm. he talked about the oneness of God, the oneness of mm -hmm. mankind, and that Tawhidi aspect of the oneness. That was like, okay, this religion right here, this goes beyond race. It's, it's something that I got to somebody, in order to understand race, you can look through race through the social, um, through the, uh, what's that people call? The uh, the social construct of race, or you look at race through the lens of Tawhid. Malcolm saw race through the lens of Tawhid, not through the social construct. This is one of the things I think for Muslims today should learn, that they keep looking at Islam, their religion, through the social construct of Urdu or Persian or Arab or whatever culture you are, you know what I'm saying? Instead of the mm -hmm. construct of Tawhid. And when you look at through the construct of Tawhid like Malcolm, then you find pride in what Allah created you. You find pride in the culture Allah put you into, but you don't allow your culture and your language within Islam to keep you divided from seeing the holistic Tawhid of Allah, from, um, of Allah in humanity. So I think that's one of the big things we can learn from Malcolm is how did he see the, how did he see Islam through the lens of Tawhid? And uh, I feel that that's the biggest thing that he saw it. Like you said, purity, think about this. When Malcolm gets to Mecca on his way to Mecca, remember, he wasn't allowed in Mecca. He had to take Shahada first. Yeah. So he takes Shahada. So at this point, he's a real Muslim. Think about that. Then he goes and takes Hajj, right? Then he does what after that? He's martyred. So here are three things that we are told in Islam that purifies you. Right, Shahada mm -hmm. purifies you, Hajj purifies you, and Shahada purifies you. I mean, like, like you talk about what can we learn from Malcolm to continue the concept to ski. Allah in the Quran says, What he's a successful he who purifies it. Malcolm continued to purify himself by getting close to understanding the Tawheed and the oneness of Allah. I think that when just my and your experiences may be similar. The problem of the Muslim world is we have allowed Western civilization in nation state concept, and we have allowed the shaitan, when it's just called a personal concept, to allow our race, our language, and our culture to have primacy over al-Islam. Whereas, like you said, Malcolm was able to go beyond that and see that through that lens. I think we all believe in that lens, but we don't really understand it. I mean, in the Quran, Allah says what? He says that um, I created you in nations and tribes that you may know one another, right? Well, it's interesting because the word he uses for is sha'ab, right? Branches. So it says that the word nation and branches mean that all the branches belong to the same tree. But if mm -hmm. we don't understand the roots of Tawheed, then we may argue and fight amongst the branches. So I think Malcolm was able to see that beautiful part of Tawheed, and that made him a stronger fighter. It made him a stronger fighter for African Americans because he saw African Americans as part of that tree of Tawheed. And you know, like um, now that we're talking about the the, the time when um, Hajj Malcolm went to 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 Hajj, and he you know, he sees this kind of unity amongst the people, right? And you can feel this like sense of like so much love that was like coming into him, you know, from Allah. Like you can just feel that. Like he was almost blinded by that love where he's not seeing, you know, the the potential differences between the, the, the races and how they're being treated and all this kind of stuff. But it was just like Allah had granted him so much love that that's all he could see and experience in that moment. And that's what he needed. You know, that's what he needed to experience in his life to know that there's something beyond um, his, his pre-existing political and, and social notions, right? And so, you know, even like today, someone might criticize and say, you know, he went to Hajj and he talks about how like, you know, everyone was, everyone is united and everyone's wearing the same clothes. But of course, we know as Muslims that there is an incredible amount of uh, prejudice and discrimination against people of darker skin colors, let alone just being black, right? Especially in places like Saudi Arabia and stuff. We know that that exists. But in that moment, Malcolm's not, he's not experiencing that. Like God's not allowed him to see that, right? He's been, because he's been so, like you said, he, there's so much ikhlas in his actions and sincerity in what he's trying to achieve. Like God has almost kind of like blinded him with love just to kind of absorb all of that. And that's essentially like the, the foundational blocks for him to receive um, his, his, his martyrdom. Yes. Yeah. I would add on to that. I think um, what's important to realize when we talked about seeing Tawheed, 
when you see the Tawhidi aspect of the world, you start to see your humanity. Mm. And this is why I always say Malcolm is not a civil rights activist. He's a human rights activist, right? And think about this. In autobiography, he says it's one of the most, if not the most beautiful, I'm trying to, there's so many beautiful things in autobiography, but this one always touched my heart where he says, I stood before the, the creator of all mankind and felt like a complete human being. I mean, just like, I, I think about that so powerful because in order to see humanity, you must first see your own humanity. He saw his own humanity before Allah. So when you talk about that sincerity and how he viewed the world, he saw his own humanity. We are still struggling to find our own humanity. What does it mean to be human? You know, sometimes we're Shia and we're Sunni or we're Sufi or we're Pakistani or we're Arab. Where is the we're, be human? So I remember one time I was in Mashhad and there's one I had talked, I got his name, and he was talking to us. He said, when you go make Ziyadah, he said to Imam Rida, alayhi salam, he said, don't ask him to make you a scholar. Don't ask him to make you a good father or to ask you for anything. He says, ask Aga, ask Imam, make me a human being. And I was talking to people like, being a human being. And I think that's part of the that's part of what we don't do Dawah anymore on. Mm. We're so focused on trying to show stuff when all the prophets and NBI came to bring us to be the complete human being that Allah created us to be. And that's mm -hmm. part of the journey. So when Malcolm sits before and says, I sat and I felt like a complete human being. To me, that's just like the pit, like the the the, the autobiography is just like wow, like he got it. <laughs> yeah. May Allah help us all. Inshallah, get it. Yeah, and 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 it's like that, you know, when you kind of reach that realization, <clears throat> you can feel that sense of yakin that he has thereafter, right? And in all of his actions, where he's not he's not scared for his life. Like he knows that this is like a temporary station, and he's so at, at ease with knowing that like eventually he will be killed like isn't he just talks about it so kind of candidly like yeah this is likely to be the end right um and one of the things that honestly just i love so much about his story is how allah took away most of his possessions just a few days before he killed like before he was killed right like his house burnt down he lost his possessions and it's like such a beautiful stage to leave like this, this life, right? With with nothing but him, right? Like, and and just a suitcase full of clothes, right? That, that's it. That's all he had at the time, I believe, right? And I just found that like to be such a a a beautiful gift from God to him, to be like, look, don't take anything else with you here but me, you know? And and Subhanallah, like he he reached his end, and yeah, I don't know. I've got I've got tears in my eyes right now. I'm trying to I'm trying to hold it together. Well, you know, well, you know who's saying, you know what I'm saying? I think that one time I asked somebody this question, a scholar, they said that Imam Hussein alayhi salam is said to Shahada, the master of all martyrs. And I asked, I said, well, there have been other people martyred after Imam Hussein, right? Even the Imams were martyred after Imam Hussein, right? Is it the way he was killed, the way he was martyred? What makes him the say to Shahada? And he says something, and it goes to what you're saying, Malcolm. He says, because everybody martyred after Imam Hussein, it is though they were at Karbala. And I'm like, like that? This is the metaphysics of our uh, of Shahada mm -hmm. that everybody martyred from say is like they join him at Karbala because it mm -hmm. brings it back to that wherever they were martyred for him, anything of justice and good refers back to Sayyid Shahada. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the beauty that I think even some of us who mourn and Imam was saying, and that's why I say I'll talk I have a lot of Sunni brothers. Look, man, to understand the Shahada Imam was saying, you understand your religion. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and, and, and it's not a Shia thing, it's a thing of understanding that beauty. That those people, even after Imam Hussein, who died for justice, you know what I'm saying? That Allah SWT has put on this earth Adal as something that is for all humanity. Uh, mm -hmm. Shahid Mutahari once said what drew jihad was, was, he said to get up and leave and go to Vietnam and fight to help the Vietnamese, who themselves are communists and maybe don't even believe in God, because you're fighting for justice and humanity. This is what Imam Hussein alayhi salam's martyrdom was about. It wasn't about a religion. I mean, it was about a religion, Islam, that was for humanity. It wasn't like mm. a certain group of people. It's Islam beyond yeah. the Islam bracket. You know, it's like that true submission, that 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 pinnacle of Tawheed. Um, and it's, it's us that thing. basically we turn Islam into the label, right? Like that's the confinement that we like to stick it inside. But it's not. That's it's beyond that. And I think you said it because it's interesting about Malcolm with martyrdom. I've done a lot of history. I got a friend doing a movie on the stuff. Uh, one of the things I find interesting, and Spike Lee did show this in his movie, is that when they pulled the gun on him, he smiled. Hmm. And to me, you know, I just think that what did he see? 
I, yeah. we don't, maybe he didn't even see. He didn't even see the gun. He's he almost saying, "Is it coming?" We have no idea. He smiles. To me, that is like, why smile? I would have been running, ducking, and he just smiled. To me, that's, you know, maybe Jabril came. We don't know. We just know he smiled. And he had a beautiful smile his whole life. And he gives us his smile all the way to the end. <laughs> you know, well, I'm going to have to hold my tears in this whole podcast, oh. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me, they said, Malcolm never said goodbye. He would always say, till I see you again. You know, because there is something else. And I think that I tell people, Malcolm is our Ayatollah. He is our mm -hmm. sign of God. He is a mm -hmm. sign of something. And the one thing is most of the world still don't even know him. You know, they don't even know his life after Mecca because his life after Mecca is the part to me that no one talks about because he internationalizes and puts the African-American struggle within the human rights struggle around the globe. This yeah. is when he becomes a threat. Saying a black man is God is not a threat to nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It is like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's a militancy and you want to calm so that. But to, when you can, like, to me, I don't know for you, I, to me, I was telling a friend of mine, the number one speech he gave that to me characterizes this full turnout is the one at Oxford University. Because when he's at Oxford, he talks about, I don't care what race you are, as long as you want to do something to change the world. It's one thing for Brother Malcolm to talk to black people and get black people to want to make change, right? It's a whole nother thing of Brother Malcolm if he has now talking to people who are white at Oxford who are parts of places where they're making change and everything and policy around the world and getting them on the side. This is not, yeah. this is, be, he's went beyond, you see what I'm coming from? Now he's networking with people regardless of their colors and their race in order to find a way for social justice. You are definitely at a different level now. And this is what I think a lot of people miss when they talk about Brother Malcolm. SubhanAllah, like as in, again, it kind of links back to the thing, right? Like he had this um, upbringing that was outside of Islam um, that was, you know, quite clearly on the polar opposite end of it, right? Mm -hmm. And Allah had kind of raised him in a way to be stripped away from all of those things so that when he does approach Islam, he didn't approach Islam from like, again, like we discussed like this cultural baggage or this idea of trying to convert yeah. people for the sake of just converting them, trying to get them to do their shahada <laughs> as if like that's the yeah. accomplishment, right? It was about trying to appeal to their humanity and make them human beings. And so then when he does go to Hajj, like you said, he, he transforms from beyond civil rights towards human rights, right? Like as in it becomes beyond just the, the paradigm of uh, American politics. It becomes much more wider. It talks about the human essence. And the fact that every human being deserves that dignity to to just be respected as a human being, right? Like to, to have that. Um, what do you think Malcolm X would say about the state of Muslims today? So we're talking about a post 9-11 era um, with discrimination against Muslims quite like open. What what do you think Malcolm X would say to Muslims today? What do you think he would think about the the situation that we're in? You know, that's a good question. I love that question. Um, and it's all speculative. I'm just going to go back to what we saw his trajectory to be and everything. Um, I would say he would say something, and I said, God, I believe to Muslims in America, I say right after 9-11, right? That they could learn from what African Americans have went through. But they still can never learn about what African Americans went through, right? Yeah. I'll give you an example. When 9 11 happened, um, I, I was married to a Persian sister, right? She wore a full hijab. When 9 11 happened, she was scared, you know? There were women taking hijab off, they didn't know what to do, right? And my mother said something to her, and I think Malcolm would have said something similar because my mom comes from a person, you know, who is influenced by Malcolm. She told her, she says, well, don't be scared about these people who are racist. She says, you see this skin complexion I got? I couldn't take that off. I can't take off my hijab. I can't change off my uh, kafia. I can, you could hide your Persianness. We couldn't hide our blackness at a time in America. The police mm -hmm. would see that and identify with us. So be proud. And so, she, you know, my wife had, she had a, you know, a black chador, right? She said, I'm very fact, let me take your chador and let me walk down the street. I wish a white person would say something to me. You know what I'm saying? Because you're like, like, be proud. I think that's what Malcolm to the Muslims in the world. 
Just stay proud of who you are and your identity with Allah and never let nobody shake your foundation, your faith, or make you not feel pride about who you are because the whole concept of white racism was to make black people feel inferior. And when you make somebody feel inferior, then you're able to control their ideas, their thoughts, and what they move. Brother Malcolm would have said to Muslims and even to other people, don't become inferior because once you think you're inferior, you lose your humanity. And when you lose your humanity, then you start doing things that are animalistic. And so I think Malcolm would have said, Stay in your ground, be proud of who you are, and know Allah SWT will reward you for standing that ground and having your honor and your dignity. You know, one of the things that like, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, like over the last like 10 years, I think we've seen as Western Muslims is this resurgence in confidence, right? There was, I think, a good period of time after 9-11 where that confidence became a bit wary. You know, after every terrorist attack, you had Muslims lining up to like apologize and, you know, and, and, and accept responsibility. You had all these like weird things happening, right? Like Muslims selling out and like advising the government now and you, you name it. Um, and then there came a time, uh, you know, I think, you know, you can distinctly notice it between the last 10 years, but I think Muslims just said, enough's enough. Like, we're, you know, like enough's enough. Like we're here, we're not going anywhere. We know this is all nonsense. We're, we're integrated. Um, and I think obviously like the internet and social media played a big role in that in terms of yes. like being able to kind of provide that, provide that moral support to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely feel like we're, we're on, we're, you know, a lot more confident as, as a group of people right now. However, what I do feel where we're perhaps lacking, and I don't think this is just limited to the to the Muslim experience either, actually. In terms of actually establishing change for justice, right? There's a there's, there seems to be a big gap between talking the talk, okay, having the hashtags on Twitter, um, changing the profile pictures and joining all these like social media campaigns and, and, and what have you. But in terms of actual change happening, there seems to be a very big gap. And that's yeah. not limited to just the the, the, the the Muslim rights issues. But I also still feel like, for example, when you look at things like Black Lives Matter, when you look at the, 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 the fight for rights of black, uh, black Americans, there still seems to be a gap between the protest and actually affecting the change. Yeah. What do you think is missing between those two things? Wow, that's an interesting question because I've talked to a lot of Muslims, especially when this quote unquote Black Lives Matter thing was going. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, they should learn from Brother Malcolm. One of the things is I think it's bad on both sides. I think let's start with the immigrant non black people who want to be for justice. They really, really should understand their own identity. I think for Malcolm, it would be like, hey, you're Muslim, then you're Pakistani. You're Muslim, then you're Arab. You're Muslim, then you're Persian. I think that we get so caught up with our own, we are we are still looking at Black Lives Matter through the lens of race instead of the lens of Tawheed. And when we do that, then we feel we have to be a certain way within this circle of, of Twitter and everything. And like I always say, you can't legislate racism. You can't make a law, okay, we have a law, no more. Racism is something that has to be out, under, it has to be purified from the inner being of somebody. Mm-hmm. So we have we Muslims who, if I put this up, it's like I'm cool and it becomes social media and it's something they want to do just to be fit in it. They're not trying to get rid of it in their heart. So when I say to the person who's Indo-Pak or Persian, I'm going to use Indo-Pak because I've had experiences, unfortunately, more with them than anybody else, right? Um, hey, uh, and there are more of them in America, right? Say, you want to go, you're, hey, Black Lives Matter, we care for black people, but you still don't want to let a black man marry your Pakistani daughter or vice versa. You're not mm. oh, hire you Black Lives Matter. You put a post, but you don't. Mm. But, but interracial marriages within our culture. And guess what? I found this out. Totally blew my mind. Maybe you know this. I was at a marriage counseling thing, and they had and I was with somebody here. Like, oh, this is gonna be a problem. There was marriage counseling, right? Big old crowd. I said, what's the problem? I said, I saw two Indo packs up there, right? For the sake of work. I said, no, he's from Hyderabad. She's from Punjab. This is gonna be a problem. <laughs> what? what are you talking about? But again, I don't. You know, there's different dynamics, but. Islam mm-hmm. should have solved that within the Indian subcontinent. So I realized mm-hmm. that <clears throat> the issue of race is something that hopefully Black Lives Matter would just open up the Muslims to look within our own subcultures to find out <clears throat> what's going on, even if it's language. It could be discrimination. I should say race. Whenever there's discrimination within our community, we should be the ones that are the example to the whole world of how to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. The Prophet Islam and the Imams of al are prime examples of this by their marriages and what they did. <clears throat> On the other end, for black people, 
Black people have taken something I'm totally against. See, I speak about it against all the time. And I speak this about when black people tell other people, we need allies. Black lives matter. You are the white people, non-black, you're the allies, you're the allies. What the heck is that? Malcolm never said allies. To me, Malcolm was against allies. He was for people who want to be, quote, unquote, let's say, working together in the struggle of solidarity. Not you over here. We're, 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 we're together in solidarity. Yuri Kuchiyama was a Japanese activist who was with Malcolm. And actually, she's the one who first jumped up on stage to give him mouth for mouth resuscitation. She was a secretary. How dare anybody call Yuri Kuchiyama an ally? You know what I'm saying? How dare somebody takes, like, um, there's a white lady by the name of, oh, uh, Jewish lady, what is her name? Uh, Beverly Axelrod. Beverly Axelrod was the lawyer for the Black Panther Party. She's white. She was Jewish. She's not an ally of the Black Panther Party. So there are all these, or uh, the guy he got released recently, um, uh, got his book, David Gilbert, right? He was part of the um, Black Liberation Army. You have many people who are not black, who participated in that struggle. When we use the language allies, then we're pushing them and making them like lead a liberal. No, we have to have camaraderie. Which is a very solid, I like the word solidarity because camaraderie is too communist. Solidarity and unity. Man, Wachta. I'm like, we need Wachta. That's the area. We need Wachta and unity in our struggle. Uh, if you look at the struggle in South Africa, right? Um, you know, you had Indians, or Indopaks, who were with Mandela and Robert Subukwe on Robin Island who were fighting against apartheid. So globally, historically, people of all different cultures and races have fought for the struggle for freedom. Nowadays, I think the Black Lives Matter, it pushes it out to a place where you're doing more segregation. I told somebody the other day, I don't believe in racial identity politics if it brings disunity, only if it brings unity. So we're going to talk about racial politics. If it's bringing us together and we're recognizing each other's different races and cultures, alhamdulillah. But if it's like, I'm over here, you're over here, then that's then you're doing the same thing that you would say the enemy of these racial politics is about. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an interesting point. I think like <coughs> one thing that I've definitely found recently is there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of slogans, right? There's a lot of like fancy words that are thrown around and terminologies that are thrown around, right? And there's also a big focus on what I would say are very like like meaningless battles taking place, right? So, for example, like, you know, and, and, and the reason why I mention it is because obviously not being black myself, but also someone that understands racism and wants to, A, purify myself from, from it, but also, obviously, I'm still brown, right? I still experience it to some degree, right? Well, one question, guys, so, question you're not black? Yeah, go on. No, I, I wouldn't you identify black. as black if I, if I was asked. You look black to me. You look, what's between me and you? How do we look any different? I mean, you got better glasses, you got a better beard, That's, and you got more hair than me. But other than that, though, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that when we use the word black, because yeah, I have a problem even with the word black, right? Mm. Because to me, black, what does it mean in our eyes as people of color? But what does it mean to the racist? See, mm. to the racist, you're black. To racist, you're yeah, a I mean. I you're I've right? I've, so, I've been told this by someone before as well, but it's just if yeah, obviously yeah. like I'm talking about black as a culture as a as an identity, right? Like as in okay, a group of people. It, um, you you lived in England, right? That's correct. Okay, I had this. We were on this thing called uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, this talk thing. Um, not WhatsApp. It's another one I was on. It's not, uh, Telegram. It's, it's a, huh? Telegram. Not Telegram. It's this. Uh, Man, it's thing when people have little chats and stuff on it, right? But anyway, I was on there, <clears throat> and uh, some English people were on there, and they got mm. really insulted because we said they weren't black. And I'm like, because you made the word. What black people in America see as black is not what black people in the Caribbean and England other. We are technically all black as far as this social politic construct that people have of racism. There's no doubt that blacks in in, 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 in other parts of the world have, have, have endured racism. But African-American, for the sake of word, culture is not the same as England or other places. And yeah. we all yeah. suffer this stuff, but there is a difference. And we, in order to have a, a diagnostic analyzation to come to a solution, we have to try to understand that in each particular place and how it manifests itself differently. So when I look at Brother Malcolm, Brother Malcolm, when he went around the world, he saw racism, but he saw and understood that this racism to people of color had different dynamics based on the social history of racism. So yeah. I give an example of something I found out. And again, this is me, my personal, what I've experienced. Pakistanis in England are tougher than Pakistanis in America. 
hundred percent. And I'm gonna tell you why, my observation, because the experience yeah. of Pakistanis in England with the British is definitely more violent and worse. Mm. And it's like, hey, like, like the, there's more of a confrontation. Pakistanis in America don't have that, so mm. it's still racism. But how? But but mm. to say that Pakistani culture both is the same, we're not going to be able to come to a conclusion. Mm. We have to understand the dynamics of this, and it's not comparing what's better or worse because America mm. could be worse because they're more they're treated them a certain way. But we have to understand the historical dynamics of blackness in order to come up. So when you say you're not black. You may not be black, but you do and have a history of experiencing racism as a, um, or indo have a history of racism like what a Paki is. Like if I heard somebody call, yeah, man, he's a Paki, that don't mean nothing to me. But if I hear a white British man say Paki, I understand that behind that, that's the yeah. saying the word there, you know? Yeah. But all yeah. these things are important in understanding how we fight through systematic racism. Mm. If we start to understand that, that, that every culture the shades may be different, but and the cultures are also different. But looking at it from a holistic approach and seeing more of the connections and the unity we have and fighting such a heinous, heinous thing like racism. So, for for you, basically, I think what you're, what can be derived from what you're saying is, rather than looking at the the kind of side effects of racism and the kind of um, labels and, and divisions that creates focus on racism itself, which is universal. I'll is go that, even one it? step farther. One step farther, right? I, I, I will use racism as a subset of the word discrimination. Mm. You know, I think that people are discriminated against wrongly regardless of, 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 of race. But the reason I say that, <clears throat> going to the Quran, when Allah says, I will create a vice region on earth, right? And he says, bow down. You know, just simplify. And it says, all bow down except Iblis. You know, he was of the jinn, right? And when mm. Allah says, why did you not bow down when I commanded you? Now? He said, because you made him of this and me of that. Mm. Shaitan discriminated. It didn't make a difference, you know, meaning that the, the, the essence of shaitan and evil is discrimination. Racism is just one that we always see. But there's other forms of discrimination based on language, based on hair color, based on different things, based on albinos. Remember, some people are like, they're albinos. We don't want to be albinos. They're mid. Oh, I don't know if you use that word. They're little people, right? I mean, there's all these different things that you can fight against. And I think that Racism is one of them, but um, chauvinism, you know what I'm saying? Uh, mm. uh, um, feminism, you know what I'm saying? If feminism is destroying things or chauvinism, it doesn't make a difference. Allah SWT wants people not to discriminate, and that he's the discriminator. You know, mm. what is it uh, in the Quran, Surah Al-Furqan, the criteria? Allah has said that. And so for us, the Prophet wasallam, he addressed all this when he said, you know, it's funny, he don't say there's no black over white. The word white wasn't in the Arabic. There's no black over red, right? He says there's mm. no anjami over Arab. You know what I'm saying? So the Prophet Muhammad, Islam, and we had with Bilal and with Salman al-Farsi, so many things where they discriminate against Bilal because he couldn't say a shiddu. You know what I'm saying? He said a shiddu when he called the Adan. Or Salman al-Farsi because he was Persian. The beauty of our religion, it addresses the issue of discrimination based on us seeing the world through the lens of Tawheed. Mm, mm, mm. It's very interesting as well because it's like then you then you think about what's the root of discrimination, right? And I think I remember um, one scholar um, uh, mentioning that the kind of root of racism or discrimination is actually arrogance. So it's almost yeah, like exactly. arrogance is, is the carnal sin, right? Where you start perceiving yourself to be better than others. Um, and exactly, exactly, Shaitan is the arrogant, right? Oh, <laughs> so it's just it's just kind of like you know very clear and upfront. And we've kind of got to fight that arrogance inside us. And I guess really, and I know this sounds so hippie, and I like as I'm getting older, like, and, and I've got a little kid now, and I'm, I'm teaching her the way of the world <laughs> as best as I can. It's world, and it's a new world out there. And it's a new world out there. I think kindness is just like, just, it's just like the key ingredient to it, you know? It's just like, if, if, you, if you're just kind to other human beings, right? Like that's, even to, to, to all creatures, forget just human beings, right? We, we're, we're kind to plants. Like I've thought from a very young age, like, you know, don't hurt plants. Like don't just like pull a leaf or a flower just because you like it. Like think about like, you know, what this 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 creature of Allah is trying to do with this exi existence. You know, if you pull this flower right now, it might kill the whole plant. Or if you pull, pull this leaf as attractive, you know, just like build that kind of kindness and understanding that, you know, there's other human beings and they experience different things. And so it's like, as I've gotten older, right? Like, as in, you know, when you're young, you're, you're kind of filled with passion, you're filled with rage at the world and, and you're, you're kind of, you know, there's a bit of aggression in you. And, and that's a good thing. That's, it's a nice thing to have at a young age. Because it, it pushes you to learn and it pushes you to grow and develop. Mm 
But then as you get older, you get married and you settle down, and you start taking things a little bit easier. You start developing nuance, right? And a wider perspective and a more balanced uh, perspective on the world. And now, for example, one thing that like has really griped me, especially when it comes to like the, the conversation around race, right? Is this almost um, reverse discrimination against poor white people, right? Mm -hmm. And this kind of, uh, collective um, generalization of them as being, you know, rednecks, uh, uneducated, um, you know, immoral, whatever it might be, right? And you just kind of lump them all in one go and then you just say, hey, you are, like, there's your Trump supporter, there's your right wing, here's your neo Nazi, and that's it. And you don't, you don't validate anything that they're saying, right? Well, let's say, for example, I remember what happened in the UK was this there was a report that came out that actually said, that the most underprivileged uh, group in society in the UK is uh, young, poor, white boys. Wow. Okay. And all of a sudden, there's now a massive furore as this is racist. And I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> hold on a second. Like, what, do you, what do you mean? Right? Like, it's, it's, it's a report saying that they are the most underprivileged, right? Because of various circumstances and, and not purely just based on the fact that they're white. Right. Uh, I mean, I mean, not to do with that, really. But generally speaking, as a, as a group of people, these guys are underprivileged. Now, I've grown up right in the UK, in, in, in the slums. Right. And I've seen this. I, I know for a fact, I know what the, I, I know that this is true. Right. Because these white families, these white poor working class families often come from broken, broken homes, addiction issues, um, drugs, gambling, you name it. OK. And so naturally, the young boy um is is left to literally fend for himself and i've i've seen this i've seen this right like it, it it does happen um but then it became like this whole thing where like now that's inappropriate to say that because there's actually black people that are suffering and i was like oh the, that's not okay like i looked at that and i was like that's not okay because now you're invalidating someone else's experience just because they're white right right and, and i'm not one of these kind of like white defenders that comes out and defends white people and that you know all lives matter and all that kind of stuff i'm not that <laughs> Right? right but there has to be some level of nuance and, and and like truthness to like this whole conversation otherwise what we're we doing otherwise we're just we're just you know creating football teams and tribes and just like that's it now like you know that's we're not prepared to go any step further than that do you yeah. feel like that's 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 a problem do you feel like that's something that needs to be addressed and what's your perspective on that well let's start with language right <clears throat> mm. I'm, i like i really think language is so important because if we have a certain word in language and we use that as the basic foundation of a conversation then we can get confused or we can be on different sides and we may not come to a complete understanding. The interesting thing is in Kuhn, when I studied in Kuhn, they have a course called Mantic. Mantic is logic, but it's funny. Mm. Mantic also means language because without a complete mm. language, the logic may not work. Yeah. So Franz Fanon, um, um, who was, you know, the philosopher, revolutionary and, and, and psychologist, he talked about how language that we use can just how we see the world. So example, when I teach a class, I don't say, I ask somebody, what were Af I ask you, what were African Americans when we came here, uh, when we came, when they came um, back in the antebellum time on plantations? What would most people say they were? Slaves. Mm. And I don't use the word slave because slave means bondage. I would use their captives because the word captive means at one time you were free and then you were put in a position. African Americans mm. have historically sell themselves as slaves, therefore they never see themselves ever as being free. You can't get free mm. if you always think that your history is full of slavery. Every culture has had slavery within at some point. Why is that we are the holding the banner of slavery up around the world? And, mm. and so it becomes an idea of how you see this word. The reason I mention all this is the word racism. Right? I got a UC Berkeley word of racism, but I think it's kind of used. There's no such thing as reverse racism, in our opinion, from a black person to a white person. Because racism is the ability to use so your, your power and your ability to keep another person from achieving the things they need in life to succeed in life. So you have institutional racism, you have institution, you have a prison, you have education, meaning that you have created a system and there are black people participate in that system, right? So, it, but it's based in race. It's a system that's holding people down based in race. When I see the poor white person and I feel for them, I think it's wrong to be prejudiced to them. Because mm -hmm. prejudice is wrong and big to be pre to, so we can be prejudiced to different races, but it doesn't mean we're racist, meaning that we're not holding them down. So black people don't have the social power to hold and oppress white people. Now we don't have the police force to go around and arrest them and, and indiscriminately 
do things that they're doing to us. That's one. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. as how do I feel about the white poor person? I feel the same way for the white rich person. You know, I think I take my approach. If you're willing to fight against just for justice, or anything, then then join in with solidarity with us for humanity. Uh, I don't know if you saw the movie um, um, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah about Fred Hampton. You know, no, people don't realize one thing Fred Hampton was the leader of the Black Panther Party in Chicago and was assassinated. They actually made a movie about him recently. But Fred Hampton worked with a brother. Actually, he was a Muslim brother. I mean, he became Muslim. And I forgot, oh, I forgot his name. He actually went down and Fred Hampton and had the Young Patriots, um, which were white, and they had the Confederate flag and they were working hand in hand with the Black Panther Party because of their poverty. So there were poor white people who worked with black, poor black people to struggle to make the world a better place. I don't think the Confederate flag is cool like that, but I get the fact that they saw themselves in the Confederate flag as a part of being poor whites in America who were also victims of the Union. And remember, most of the white people in America did not own slaves. So once you categorize all white people as slave owners, that's a lie. It was, it was rich white people who had slaves. And you had poor white people who were ditched servants. But the one thing I think white people in America, and Malcolm addresses this that they have to deal with, is even if they're poor, sometimes, he says this, somebody said this, black people have to purify themselves of an inferiority complex that the system of racism has done. White people got to purify themselves from a superiority complex that has been put in their heart. You know what I'm saying? That has to happen. So if you're mm-hmm. white, mm-hmm. you have to get rid of the, the, in, the superiority. You can be mm-hmm. poor, but still think you're better. I'm better than them black people because the society has made you to feel you're superior. So that sickness of superiority has to get rid of. And the inferiority complex of black people has to get rid of. But guess what? It shouldn't go from blacks going to superiority to whites being inferior. You see what I'm going wrong? That's neither yeah. human nor neither place. And so to me, when I see white people in different cultures and race, races, accepting the humanity and looking at us through the lens of humanity and judging a racist is a racist. Regardless of what his color is, if he's discriminating against somebody racist, and it's wrong. And get them to see that we're going to stand up against you for what you do, but it's too prong. If you're trying to kill me, I'm going to defend myself. And I'm going to educate you that you're wrong at the same time. You know, I think if we look at Islam and the discrimination, and this is crazy when you think about discrimination outside, Yazid Lanatale versus Imam Hussein, in many ways, is the battle of Bani Hashim versus Bani Umayyad. <laughs> Bani mm. Umayyad has always wanted an Arab, it was Arab nationalism. I tell people all the time, this is the issue of Arab nationalism that was in the Muslim Ummah that took over. And it, Prophet, I mean, Imam Hussein said, I come to reform the Ummah of my, my, prof, of, of my father, Wahid, Tawheed. So black people come at me, and you may have heard this, man, the Arabs came to Africa and they did all this and they did this in slavery. I don't defend that because that's not Islam. That's Arabs yeah. who had Islam and they yeah. did this bad stuff. Yeah. So yeah. to yeah. me, sometimes Muslims, we're defending Muslims when they're doing wrong. We as Muslims should stand up and not defend people who do things in the name of Islam just as the Christians should go against the uh, 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 um, <clears throat> the oppressor in their religion or the Jew in their religion or the Hindu. All the religious people should go to that, like you said, that essence of humanity and kindness and look and be judged of not only others indiscretions, but those within our own ranks who are in this, um, who are right, I'm doing wrong. Mm. And I think like, uh, you know, it kind of circles back now actually to, to the point that was made <laughs> earlier about like what makes Malcolm X so unique, right? Is that he was, he, he, he didn't, you know, he didn't have access to the wider world growing up, right? He only saw what he saw in front of him. Yeah. He didn't have access to these like wild interpretations of Islam uh, whether it's Wahhabism, whether it's Shiism, whether it's being a Sufi or a Sunni, whatever it might be, he he just had the basic information in front of him, and he kind of processed that. But because his uh, approach was so sincere, he was able to kind of make those right conclusions, right? But like, it's like we hold on to, and we sometimes defend the indefensible purely because it's like, oh, we're trying to stick to our side, like we're trying to kind of defend our team, you know. Um, and that's not obviously that's not going to be helpful. And I think like this more um, human rights, this like human centric approach that you've been you've been talking about is for sure like a way um, for, for all of us to kind of uh, grow from this. Um, Hashim, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your kind of um, personal um, relationship with the with, with the, the Shabazz family, um, because I know that you've obviously. Um, you've been a mentor to uh, Malcolm X's grandson 
um, and you're good friends with Kabila Shabazz as well. So um, would you mind like just sharing about like how, how that kind of um, story came about? It's funny. Um, it kind of goes back to what you said about Malcolm and his influence on my life. Uh, I know, you know, Sheikh Jaff from Mohibla, right? He's a African-American alum here in America. Really good brother. Everybody should, I mean, also I studied with him in Kuhn and he's here and he was studying in Syria, right? Mm. And he had put, we were on some group chat email. He said, hey man, I met, I was in a library in Zainabia and I saw somebody there and I'm talking to him. It was Malcolm X's grandson and he became, I mean, he started practicing his religion, let's say, and he accepted the way of Ahl Bayt, right? Like, oh, wow. I said, cool. I'm the law. So, you know, cool with it and everything. Um, and then, you know, back then people using Facebook. So I saw him on Facebook. I added him on Facebook. He added me and that was it. Um, and then one day on Facebook, he sends me a message. <laughs> it was like out of the blue. I'm sitting there like, oh, wow. So we start talking on chatting, whatever you call it. I don't know, on Facebook. And, and then he decided that he wanted to leave Zainabia. And he wanted to go someplace to learn more of his religion. And instead of being in a place, he needed more personal connection, not just books. Mm. And he wanted to be in a household. And so he asked me out the blue. He said, can I come live with you? And, you know, uh, I had, I'm looking like, should I ask my wife? Absolutely not. <laughs> right? so I said, hey, I'll buy you a ticket. And we're living in an apartment complex in Miami. I'm like, I got a son. Well, I said, hey, man, you can come. So next, it was nighttime. My wife wakes up and says, hey, you know what? Uh, Malcolm, um, uh, ex's grand says, don't come stay with us. You know, we'll get him going, get him going place. He'll stay with us for a while. She was like, you didn't want to talk about it? I said, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> if it wasn't for his grandfather, you probably wouldn't be here right now. So we're just going to skip all the intro, the middle part. And like, like, how do you say no to Malcolm X's grandson? Yeah. He needs a place yeah. to stay. It's like, like, not going to happen. So I just tucked it in. She was cool with it, though. But it was just funny because I think that the influence that he had on me, it's like, to me, I felt honored by a law that, you know, again, I mean, it made me cry. Sometimes I feel that I may have done one good deed in the world. I don't know. I know I got a bunch of bad ones, but maybe I did. I must have done something or somebody prayed for me because to me, I feel if Malcolm's still alive, maybe he sent his grandson to me. Maybe I did mm. something that Malcolm or, you know, Allah obviously chose that this man would come live with me. And he came, he lived with me. And um, we in Miami, we got him his own place. And I had some people in this African-American uh, um, movement who I sent him to go work with. So he just did tours all around the place and talk about religion. And I remember we had this big debate because he had these braids in his hair, right? And I was like, hey, man, you might want to cut the braids out, man, because, you know, I don't know if it fits, you know what I'm saying? You still look kind of thuggish and everything. You know, you can do a lot more work. You know, I'm not saying I'm against it, but, you know, you cut your... He said, like, I'm never cutting my hair. I'm never cutting my hair. I'm like, all right, man. But I'm telling you, a lot going to have you cut your hair one day, right? He didn't say go. He said, okay. And he kept going. Two years later, he calls me up. You were right. I said, what? I had to cut my hair for Allah. Where was he at? <laughs> he was at Hodge. So he had to cut his hair. <laughs> so it's funny how it just, it was like Allah sent me a lot, you know, that Allah had him cut his hair. So when you see pictures, it, like he had braids, but it's him going to Hodge, he cut his hair. And, you know, his Hodge is beautiful, just like his grandfather's and everything. It, it, it changed him. And, you know, by the grace of Allah, he accepted the way of Ahlul Bayt. Um, he accepted him on Hussein Alayhi Salaam. But he didn't go and differentiate like I'm Shia. He never would. Really, he said it's not important to say I'm Shia. He walked off to Sunni Shias and everybody because he felt like his grandfather, the Tawheed. If he chose to follow the Ahlubayt as a way of fit for him, he never said that Sunnis were wrong. He said, like, look, man, this is where, you know, I feel that, you know. So I thought that, that was part of his Hickman wisdom that he was able to say, I'm this, but I'm working together to everybody. And unfortunately, you know, he went to Mexico City and was murdered um, on a way to do Dawa down in the south. And after that, me and his mother started getting closer and everything. So me and Quabilla got closer because I had to bury him and take care of all of that. Um, and now, since then, I've been working with her with the Malcolm X Legacy uh, website in order to get people to look and not sell products as much as learn the legacy. We, we've got a long ways to go. We're you know, dealing with it. But Quabilla is a, 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 a wonderful person, um, and she suffered a lot. You know, I'll tell you this one story. I seldom tell people, but I'll share it on this YouTube because it was so many years ago. When Brother Malcolm... Latif was murdered. He came back and we brought him to Oakland. So we had to do, uh, I was trying to get through this while crying, right? We had to uh, bury him. And so obviously we had to wash the body. Uh, I don't know if you ever washed the body, but washing the body, a dead body in itself is a lot. 
But a mm. murdered body, it was it was a lot for us, man, because his whole body was it was like Emmett Till. He was beaten. So we're washing the body and we're playing no house. It's interesting for Imam Hussein. You know what I'm saying? And you know, mm-hmm. we get to the part, Imam Hussein says the says he was B confined, meaning Imam Hussein had no confined. And we're putting in a confined mm. on little Malcolm and everything. So we're right doing it. So at the funeral parlor, uh, which is interesting, I don't know about little Bobby Hutton had been murdered by the Oakland PD. It's the same funeral parlor that little Bobby was killed by the Panthers. So there was also a connection there for us in Oakland and the um, African American struggle. Um, um, but his mom, Quabilla, comes in and she says, I want to see Malcolm one more time, you know? And I'm like, sis, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you want to, you know, see his body. She said, now I got to see my baby one more time. And it's amazing. So it's like about six of us were sitting there. She walks in. He's like, we have him all in the confine and everything. He's laying there. And she walks up and she rubs his arm and rubs his leg. And we're sitting there crying like crazy, right? Because she did not, well, for me, she did not cry one tear for her son. She cried one mm-hmm. tear. She rubbed him and walked off. And the only thing I could think about was Zadab, what do you about with Sayyidina Yisleta Karbala? At some point, what is it that Allah gives a woman that can see their children, their brother massacred? And Zayn of Kubra says, hey, guess what? I gotta, I, I can't, I can't mourn this right now. I, I, I gotta go on. And she just went on. And to us, to see such strength in a woman to look at the murdered body. And then she said later on, Hashem, my son is murdered. My father was murdered. And remember, Corey Bobby, and my grandfather was murdered. Here's mm-hmm. a history of a woman who's went through so many things and trauma of her grandfather was a father of Marcus Garvey killed by the Klan. Her father, Malcolm, we talk about now, was a civil rights, was a human rights activist, and he was martyred. And then here her son was going down to Mexico to do work, murdered. May Allah SWT have mercy on the souls and the families of people who, um, uh, what do you call it? Are the victims of martyrdom in one mm-hmm. way? But I believe that Allah SWT will take care of them and love them and give them a, a serenity that maybe one day, you know, we will be able to see and understand. I mean, I mean, and so like during that time, um, which I'm, I'm guessing was like probably very, very difficult for you. Um, what were the kind of actions after that? Like, you know, what, what kind of, what did, what did that moment um, spark for you going forward from there? I'll be honest with you. I probably just, man, how many years? Maybe seven, eight years? I don't think I've ever had a chance to mourn it. Hmm. You know, because it's such it's such a... I told, I told little Malcolm this, and it's so funny when I think about what I told him. The last time I saw Malcolm, I did. I used to work with Isaiah Thomas, play for the Pistons at FIU, and we did this all-star game with LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, right? In um, Miami, called the South Bay Classic. And, you know, I, he was there. I saw him there. And I told him, you know, you and LeBron are like at the same age. But LeBron's going to have an impact. You're going to have an impact. I really do believe that if Malcolm was not with little Malcolm was here now, he would be sitting and working with the people now. And he would be bringing that concept of Tawheed and unity because he was such love by all different cultures and races. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I think that the people like LeBron who did not know, he would have been that link for them to understand the true Malcolm X, not the racialized Malcolm X. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. um, so for me, uh, I understand the law has a wisdom. He knows best what, you know, what's best. Um, but for me, it was definitely... Uh, a, a, a loss that I have not totally ever been able to mourn because just uh, it's hard to comprehend um, the things. And, and the other thing is, you know, and he, he was killed. So he lived and was raised in the same house with my son. And mm. he just happened to be killed on my son's birthday. So it's always hard to get through his birthday and him being killed on that same day, you know. Um, but it's definitely uh, what I can learn from it. What I would say is at the funeral, what I learned is that people love Malcolm. They love his grandson. And one thing they both had in common were beautiful smiles and sincerity in their heart. Regardless of, I mean, their actions, you know, they really had sincere hearts and trying to do good for Allah and trying to find their way. I mean, I mean, 
Uh, Brother Hashim, I just wanted to ask you one final question, um, and I'm sure we've you've probably touched uh, on this during our conversation. What would be your like one piece of advice for any Muslim listening to this, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're brown, in the UK, in the USA, old or young? Um, what would be one advice that you would give them uh, to, to to take away from the legacy of Malcolm X? Wow. Good question. Very good question. I would say this. When Malcolm, no, I'm going to tell it one story and then, and then I'll go back to Malcolm because I think this one story connects it to see it and juxtapose it because I always want to try to always talk about Islam in some way to for non-Muslims and Muslims and for the non-Muslims what they were. One time, I was in uh, Iran when I was studying. I came back, and I don't know if you ever see that picture of Zuljana, the horse, and the women with your door on it, and they're crying mm-hmm. in, in the horse. I saw. I, I liked it, so I bought it. I wrote it up. Then I had another calligraphy that y'all bought doing. I'm saying something I'm saying, so I'll take it. But you know, when you fly overseas, you can't just walk around with it open. <clears throat> so I rolled them up. <clears throat> Excuse me. So after I rolled them up, um, I went to Berk in Berkeley. There's a place where they take it and they can take it and make it flat. But they put it on a piece of wood. So that way it's a wooden thing, you know, a uh, frame. I go there, I give it to them. When I go there and give it to them and everything, I leave. Two weeks later, I come back. So there's two older white women. It had to be maybe in their 60s, you know, and they work at this frame place, right? So they open up and show it to me. Hey, look at this, look at this. Oh, it's good. It's like, oh, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. They said, what is it? You know, what's this calligraphy and this horse thing? I was like, oh, it's, it's just a religious thing. So I wrap it up and I walk off. As I'm walking off, why does Sir Abbasa come in my head? You know what I'm saying? We're like the one who frowned with the blind person. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. The I said, man, I just got to, you know, let me go back and tell them what it was. So I go back and I say, how do I explain this to older white women? Right? I said, hey, do you know 9 11 when that, you know, they hit the building and it fell down? They said, yeah. I said, this horse had a man on it. I said, if that man, never fell off that horse and was killed, 9-11 wouldn't have ever happened. Like, what do you mean? Mm. I said, no, this man's the significance of this person on his horse is so important. And I tell him about a short 10, 15 minute talk about what happened to Imam Hussein, what he rose up for, humanity, <clears throat> love, Islam, and talk about what they did Imam Hussein, how they did the bodies and everything. And as I'm telling the story, I look up and hear these two older white women crying. That was a lesson to me, more than them. And I said, in the fitra, in their heart, is the fitra of Allah and Tawheed and the love of Allah. And how do you not love Allah? And you love Allah, you must love Hussein ibn Ali and what he stood for, because it's connected to your fitra. You know Hussein's mission for Muslims or not is connected to the fitra of humanity of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam, what he stood for, because it's connected to the universe and it's connected to his father, his um, his son, Imam Zaman alayhi salam, to come back to avenge that, that, that and bring purity. Because remember, Imam Zaman alayhi salam and Isa, they don't come from Muslim the Shia, they come from humanity. And so mm-hmm. I said, because in that point, when I looked at, at these women, I made a, what we talked about, a judgment, not bad, but just like, what would they think? What would they care about this? Instead of saying, no, these are a lot of slaves and I'm going to not judge them and let me talk to them. And I saw the reaction. How does that correlate to Malcolm? Because the next time a Muslim or somebody sees a little thug, a little snotty head black kid run around acting crazy, Malcolm mixes that little kid. Next time you see some gangster, some person in Brixton or someplace acting up or something, whether they're black, Pakistani, or there's some Pakistani kid out there smoking weed or doing drugs and everything, Malcolm came out of that. So to me, sometimes we judge the actions, but we always realize that in the fitra of some of these of people is a lost mm-hmm. spirit. And sometimes mm-hmm. look beyond what you see and know that the next Malcolm X is out there. They're just looking for that exploration. So whether they're white, whether they're black, wherever they are, we have to look at the humanity, humanity people, stand against racism when people are wrong, because that's justice. But what also is justice is calling people to truth. And Hussein Ibn Ali did what on the Ashura? He called people truth and still fought them. He called them the truth and he still rose up. He called them the truth and died. Let's call people the truth and stand strong and represent Islam and realize that Malcolm X um, is a is an example of somebody who Allah dropped from darkness to nur, and that darkness to nur is what we should be calling people to 
as we simultaneously stand for those people who don't, because some people are going another direction. So we stand up against those people going another direction, but we help other people to go to the, uh, uh, towards truth and happiness and by calling people to true Islam. I, I don't think there's a better place to end this podcast and this conversation. It's It's been truly a revelation to me. It's been uh, deeply emotive. Like I've, there's, there's been multiple times I've just had to hold back the tears. Um, I'm probably going to have a nice little cry after we end the call. Um, thank you so much, Brother Hashim. Honestly, like the the passion and love um, that I can sense coming out of your, your words and from your heart is 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 so warm and and gives me so much more confidence in in being a muslim if i'm if i'm very honest with you sure. well i pray thank you um for the opportunity to talk about malcolm anytime people it's like poetry you know what i'm saying whenever you talk about something you love it, it, it generates more love and strength and i thank you for that and i ask Allah to forgive us for our sins and draw us near to him and his oneness and i pray Allah soon and for all, Amen. let's pray for all the shahada, all the oppressed people in the world of all races and cultures to come and be and come to Allah. And we ask Allah to give us strength against those who are the enemies of humanity and those who have chosen not to change. And let us stand up against them and with justice and not aggression, but with justice and peace. And inshallah, thank you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all on our trials and tribulations. As-salamu alaykum. Ameen. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was my conversation with Hashim Ali, a truly wonderful human being. And you can really sense that love from his heart when he talks about these issues. I literally do need a moment actually to just kind of process that conversation. I'm recording this segment straight after that. And I still just need some time actually to, to walk away and reflect, like he said, on the life and legacy of Malcolm X on a more deeper level beyond just the social political uh, paradigm that we often see him in. If you've made it this far in the podcast, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If you could um, like, comment, subscribe, wherever you're listening to, um, just any sort of engagement would be really appreciated. Just to let us know that you're listening, that you're active, um, and that you've made it this far in the podcast. It helps us uh, helps us know that. Um, if you've got any comments or feedback uh, that you'd like to give about this podcast, um, that's a new thing. Now I'm going to uh, put my email address out there. Uh, I feel like I need to connect with you guys more if you're listening. So uh, feel free to drop me an email at haseeb at themuslimvibe.com. I'll leave a link for that in the description. Um, so if, any, if you've got any feedback, comments, uh, any recommendations for topics or guests that you want me to speak to, then uh, please do uh, get in touch and I'll deeply appreciate that. Uh, that's it from me today. Inshallah, we'll be with you again soon. Barakallah, Fiqh. See you next week maybe longer.